Good afternoon, everyone. Um, apologies for a little bit of a late start, but it's um, it's a, a great pleasure to be able to introduce today's uh, seminar speaker, Professor Matthew Morell. And I'm just struggling to change this slide because I now can do it. So I feel good about myself. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Ian Godwin. I'm the director of the Centre for Crop Science in Coffee. And um, I would like to uh, do the acknowledgement of country. The University of Queensland acknowledges the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to the country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Now, just a reminder to people that our seminar today is scheduled from 12 to 1. Um, throughout the webinar at any time, you can type your questions into the Q&A tab. So you'll see that at the bottom of your screen. Um, don't use the chat function or we'll, we'll miss the questions. So we won't actually be asking any of those questions until the end. So at the end, I'll, I'll uh, be able to moderate those questions and, and give Matthew plenty of time to answer them. Um, apologies if your question doesn't get answered because often with these seminars, we do get a lot of questions and we just run out of time before we can um, ask all the questions. So um, I first met Matthew when he was at CSIRO. Um, Matthew was um, doing a lot of research in, in grain quality. At the time, he was actually um, doing some world leading research um, on the nutritional quality of wheat and barley. And it, it was really exciting work. And then it, it seemed that right in the middle of that, uh, um, there were some outcomes that occurred and then Matthew um, disappeared from Australia and then he popped up in the Philippines. He was the, um, he'd been um, basically recruited there as the uh, deputy DG research. And then he'd only been there, I think for a couple of years and then he became the director general of ERI, the International Rice Research Institute. And we're very fortunate that um, earlier this year, Matthew came back to, to head up coffee and so without further ado, I'll pass on to you, Matthew. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Ian, for the introduction. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, we have had some technical issues leading into this, so I'm keeping my fingers crossed that we get through this seminar okay. But it is my first seminar as Coffee uh, director and what I thought would be a good use of this opportunity to introduce myself but also to uh, reflect on some of the major themes that I think we'll be addressing uh, over the next few years in coffee and in Australian uh, agriculture and research more, bread, more broadly. And so I, I was struck when I came back to Australia after seven years away how much had changed but also how much hadn't changed. So, uh, for example, uh, we've had many conversations here about uh, careers in research in Australia and how we can support people to build uh, productive careers in academia, but also uh, in science and, and in society more broadly. Secondly, you know, I'm really cognizant of the, the pressure, frankly, that the government is putting on universities and public sector research uh, to demonstrate that uh, productive and, and valuable outcomes flow from the research investment. Uh, and I'm also uh, reflecting on changes and uh, that have occurred in, in our connections uh, in terms of science with our region and our partners. And so my experiences, I guess, in Erie and the Philippines and the CGIR system more broadly are something I'd like to just reflect on briefly. And then finally, you know, we're in an environment where technology is moving rapidly. What we can do uh, changes very quickly from day to day. So uh, I'll also reflect a little bit on that. So uh, hopefully we can get through all of this in the, in the time uh, available. So, um, I'll come back to what my title means uh, during that. 
um, that during the talk. So the reflections, a few thoughts about building that career. I, I don't have all of the answers uh, to an improved career structure in my hands. Um, I'm sorry to tell our higher degree students and early and mid career researchers, but perhaps some reflections that we can talk about further in coming discussions uh, about that research for impact, research for development and our path forward. So I guess um, like many of you, um, when I started out uh, as a bright eyed young person thinking about a career in science, I thought you know, it would be a pretty um, straight line that one just uh, continued on doing research and was supported by society uh, through to the finish line, whenever that is. But of course, the reality um, that we experience is very different, that there are ups and downs in a research career. There is a need to constantly uh, reinvent yourself and think about uh, where you're going and what you're doing to take advantage of opportunities uh, for the future. And so uh, I've put in here a, a concept of, of crossing the Rubicon, which of course comes from uh, Julius Caesar and his attempts to march his army from Gaul back into Italy. And once he crossed the river Rubicon, there was no return. So I feel in our careers, we have moments where really decisive decisions have to be taken uh, and that they do uh, change the course of our career uh, for uh, the, the remainder of our time. So uh, I've seen a few points like that and I'd like to reflect on that. So really going all the way back, but uh, in my life to starting out uh, in Wagga and an agricultural high school, an agricultural focused high school. And I guess the reflection that I make here is that I think I was quite a pest and I really annoyed uh, particularly my agriculture teacher by asking him why things were the way they are rather than taking them at face value. And his response to me was, well, go to university and find out the answer. So, uh, of course, that's what I did. I did my uh, undergraduate and PhD at, at Sydney University in the Faculty of Agriculture, as it was then, uh, went to UC Davis uh, and then to Michigan State. And each of these um, situations uh, taught me a lot, built a, a toolkit in terms of capacity and biochemistry and uh, genetics uh, that have um, held me in good stead and also exposed me to some mentors who really helped me along the way. So I guess my first point is the, really the importance of um, being mentored, getting that uh, strong uh, advice and direction in terms of your science, but also the directions ahead. Now to skip forward, after being at Michigan State, um, I came back to the ANU and really the, the title slide around Rubisco, I spent uh, about seven years uh, one way or the other working on Rubisco. Uh, and if you don't know what Rubisco is, um, it is the enzyme that shapes our world. It's the enzyme that fixes carbon dioxide uh, and of course is subject to competition from oxygen. Uh, and it is this balance between the carboxylation reaction and the oxygenation reaction, which determines uh, much of the productivity of our agricultural system. So, of course, there's an inherent interest uh, in improving the efficiency of that enzyme. And the approach uh, that we took was really to understand the way in which the enzyme works. So, uh, shown here, the, the straightforward carboxylation reaction. Uh, but the fact that the enzyme is insufficiently able to distinguish between carbon dioxide and oxygen. And so the uh, reaction through uh, the oxygenation and 
the inefficiencies inherent in that uh, side reaction uh, a big part of C3 agriculture and of course the driver for the development of, of C4 photosynthesis. But Rubisco doesn't stop there. It also releases other reaction intermediates in an unproductive way. Uh, many of us don't appreciate that Rubisco produces us a significant uh, side reaction pyruvate, which of course uh, is released through into uh, the metabolism of the plant. Um, and uh, it again, reduces the overall efficiency of the enzyme. So my task there uh, in a major project that lasted a number of years was to look at uh, amino acid residues in the active side of the enzyme and to understand uh, their role in catalysis. And could we influence that vital carboxylation oxygenation uh, ratio? Now, of course, uh, nature has had three billion years to do this. And uh, perhaps uh, the last few hundred million years, as oxygen levels have increased in the atmosphere, rubiscos have been under very strong selective pressure. So perhaps one could argue that it's a little bit arrogant for us to consider that using our modern tools, that we could rapidly uh, develop uh, a much more efficient rubisco. But certainly one has to dream, one has to have an ambition. So in this example, what I'm going to show is just that we replaced threonine residue 65 at the active side of this particular form of rubisco, the large subunit with a range of other amino acids to, uh, to look at what happened in terms of catalysis. Now, interestingly, each of these enzymes was able to fold and was catalytically uh, active. But uh, in fact, each of these mutants was less able to discriminate between carbon dioxide and oxygen. So, of course, we made a less efficient enzyme. But perhaps the outstanding learning from this was that by playing around with one of the residues that was key in binding to uh, one of the phosphate residues of uh, ribulose bisphosphate, the enzyme actually released that intermediate uh, in a form, an unstable form. The phosphate was eliminated and some 13% of the flux of carbon through these modified uh, rubiscos was lost. So uh, one can understand uh, through this more the, the criticality of individual residues to stabilize the numerous reaction intermediates in the Rubisco reaction. So uh, this was uh, a study that uh, was published in the Journal of Biological Chemistry. Um, and I felt uh, proud on one hand that we'd really been able to dissect uh, the reaction pathway of Rubisco and the roles of residues at the active site. Um, but the comment was made when we published this paper that really only a few people in the world would understand the significance of this work because there are not that many aficionados of the fine details of the Rubisco reaction um, mechanism. So it did make me uh, really think about what I was doing in my career. So was I interested in continuing with essentially basic research uh, or did I want to do research that could much more directly uh, make a difference. And of course, the answer was that I wanted to uh, engage in research that had a more tangible and direct path to industry or community impact. So I really appreciate the work of those who continue with basic research, but it wasn't my personal choice. So my first crossing of the river was really to move from basic research, where publications and the quality of the journal is all encompassing uh, to research uh, to make a difference. Um, and that's really where I have focused the rest of my career, but in the context of really appreciating that basic research. <laughs>
So in order to do that, I did move to CSIRO, as Ian has mentioned, and spent much of the next decade really defining uh, the genes, uh, particularly in wheat and barley, uh, that determine the synthesis of starch. And uh, shown here is the exon intron structure of the major genes. And I guess the first point I'd like to, to make is that, you know, this uh, was a major undertaking uh, at the time, but of course with modern genomic sequencing um, would be a completely different proposition now in uh, 2020. But the focus wasn't on defining those genes, it was on understanding how we could use those genes uh, to make a difference. So the approach uh, overall that we took was to really look at cereal and all seed uh, seeds and to understand or to consider how we could modify the structure of those uh, components of the grain in ways that led to uh, particularly health outcomes that would be beneficial for consumers. And so by looking at uh, poly and oligosaccharide starch, protein, micronutrients, lipids, uh, to a whole range of possibilities are theoretically possible in terms of modifying health outcomes for consumers. And of course, lifestyle diseases, which result from uh, an inadequate or a poor diet, are a major cause of many of these conditions uh, for us in Australia, but around the world. So I'm just going to point quickly without uh, I hope uh, any glossing over of, of years of work to a number of outcomes that came from that program that I was uh, privileged to lead uh, in CSIRO. And the first of those uh, is with New Seed, uh, which was uh, land-based omega-3 canola. And I was not involved in this uh, as a personal uh, research contributor, but to the funding and commercial arrangements. And I'm very pleased to see that project uh, coming through into the market. The second example was really a very uh, quite audacious target at the time, which was to uh, engineer uh, in a non-transgenic way barley to remove uh, the gluten and analogs, the hoardine genes, in order to produce uh, a barley that could be consumed by people with celiac disease uh, or with wheat avoidance. So again, a gluten intolerance, wheat avoidance. So again, that work has found its way uh, to the marketplace and very uh, proud of the work that Crispin and his team have done there in CSIRO to progress that. But I will focus uh, a little more on Barley Max uh, and uh, the Arista project, which is around high amylose wheat, because uh, I think this is an interesting case study in what is possible, but also how the times have changed, how we could uh, do this work in a much more clinical uh, and rapid way, given the tools that we now have um, at our disposal. So the concept behind Barley Max was really to look for modifications of the starch biosynthetic pathway uh, in the first target was to increase amylose. And it was well known from the maize example that increasing amylose resulted in lower glycemic index. It would result in a, a source of dietary fiber that was interesting. And barley was uh, an interesting choice because in many ways it's underutilized particularly in, in many Western countries, with some notable exceptions, as a source of food uh, directly for humans. But it has a lot of potential because of high dietary fiber, uh, particularly beta-glucan. So we looked for mutants of uh, barley that had high amylose and indeed uh, were able to find some in a collection of mutants that Peter Chandler had, which he generated uh, using chemical mutagens for other purposes. But the 
um, very exciting part of this from a nutritional perspective was not only did we modify uh, the uh, fiber component, the blue, uh, the dark blue bar there, which is resistant starch, but we also increased the levels uh, of non-starch polysaccharides and indeed beta-glucan also increased the level of lipids and increased the level of free sugars. So this provided a very different uh, organoleptic profile uh, to the barley that had an inherent interest uh, beyond the changes in starch biosynthesis. And it was, uh, again, uh, a, a diagram which uh, condenses many years of work, uh, particularly wonderful work done by Zhang Yi Li in the lab to define the causal mutation, which was in one of the starch synthase genes, a different mutation to the one known in maize, uh, and indeed later in wheat to control high amylose. And that single base change uh, diverted the flux of carbon through the starch biosynthetic pathway to result in more linear change, the amylose fraction, but also a pool of carbon that was then utilized by the plant to synthesize lipids and non-starch polysaccharides uh, to a greater extent than in the wild type. So this was fundamentally the basis of uh, the novel grain phenotype. From a breeding perspective, uh, the interesting part was that this produced uh, a perfect marker, if you like, and a very simple genetic um, locus to be able to introgress through into breeding materials. And again, cutting a long story short, uh, this was bred into uh, hullless barley uh, in a Himalaya background um, and through to um, a barley variety that could be grown for production. And here, just to show you the uh, competitive advantage of this barley in terms of fibre uh, resistant starch, insoluble fibre versus other barleys, but wheat, oats and, and corn. Uh, in this example. So this was of nutritional interest, uh, engaged strongly with the CSIRO Human Nutrition Group in Adelaide and other partners to define those nutritional benefits uh, and set up a closed loop production chain uh, and licensees to take Barley Max uh, through to the consumer. And one of the selling points was indeed the reduction in glycemic index. And, and another way to look at that is the glycemic load, which is the glycemic impact for a standard um, amount of carbohydrate. And so uh, there was a, a clear uh, value proposition. So uh, I'm pleased to say that in 2010, um, company uh, Goodness Superfoods were the first to introduce Barley Max into products uh, on your supermarket shelves. Uh, and since then, a range of other licensees in Australia and now internationally are incorporating Barley Max into products because of that uh, unique health and also toast, taste profile. So uh, like many developments, I, I just want to reinforce that it took 12 years to get from the point of the first identification of that mutation through to it being on the supermarket shelf. So uh, my one message for the funders of research is that these developments do take time. They don't happen in a three year funding cycle. So the sustainability of our uh, fundamental research and strategic research is really important. My second point is that 11 years on from the introduction of Barley Max, it's still on the supermarket shelves. And I take great uh, personal or pride in that outcome because 95% of such innovations typically fail. So it does have something going for it uh, to have that longevity. And I look forward to 
even more products coming to you to improve your nutritional outcomes based on barley mix. But reflecting on uh, barley mix uh, in the context of say what we consume as Australians uh, and in many countries, uh, you know, barley is a really a, a very small part of the direct human diet. Most of that orange quadrant there is of course fed to animals or used in the brewing and malting industry. So uh, the big games in Australia in terms of direct human consumption are wheat uh, and um, to a lesser extent, some of our other pulses, legumes and cereals. So that was a driver to look at similar um, modifications of functionality uh, in wheat. And here looking again from, through the lens of high amylose starches, at uh, nearly 800 lines here that were in our germplasm collections, there was variation, but nothing like the variation required to generate the nutritional uh, profile that we're looking for. So we had to go uh, further in being able to define the genetics that we needed uh, to uh, generate such a phenotype. Now here we were fortunate in that we had access to the recently developed tool of RNAi down regulation and we took the approach of down regulating uh, a number of the genes in the starch biosynthetic pathway in wheat and to our surprise uh, it turned out not to be the same gene as in Mali, barley or as in the, wheat, the maize example so it was the starch uh, branching enzyme 2A gene that needed to be down-regulated to generate the high amylose phenotype. And of course, that was novel from a scientific point of view, but also uh, very interesting from an intellectual property uh, point of view. And I'm pleased to say that the, the wonderful work that Regina Ahmed and the team did was recognised here in a publication in PNAS. But with our commercial partners, uh, Lehman Grain and GRDC, we realized that we had to go back to uh, a non-GM approach. Uh, and in wheat, we have the complexity of three wheat ge genomes. So doing a simple mutagenesis as we had done in barley was not uh, a, a possible approach given the vanishingly small probability of picking up mutations in each of the three genomes. But of course, there were examples uh, in other pathways in wheat uh, where this had been done. And in the starch biosynthetic two, pathway, two examples, GBSS and SS2A, where null alleles had been identified in each of the genomes and combined. So that was our task in wheat. Uh, from about 2007, eight, uh, to identify mutations in the branching enzyme genes. Uh, and in wheat, these two uh, genes are co-located and to identify and combine the mutations. Now, I know many of you are sitting there thinking, well, you just do CRISPR-Cas and this is all resolved, but those tools were not available at that time. So we had to devise strategies to identify those mutations and combine them. And again, to cut a long story short, uh, that was achieved and we're, we were able to generate uh, a triple mutant of such branching enzyme 2A and a partial mutant of branching enzyme 2B that did have the target amylose content uh, which resulted in higher dietary fiber, higher resistant starch, and many of the phenotypes that were associated, but not, interestingly, not some of the phenotypes found in barley, such as high beta-glucan uh, or particularly high lipid levels. But there was uh, a, a really uh, telling difference shown in green against the um, brown profile here for the wild type uh, wheat in terms of, of the starch chain links 
and the preponderance of longer chain lengths in the amylopectin and uh, fraction of the starch led to these nutritional impacts. So uh, I'm again very pleased to say that since uh, I left the project in the end of 2013. It's continued on strongly with support from Lee McGrain, uh, GRDC and CSRO uh, through the formation of spin-off company Arista Serial Technologies and uh, the technology is being commercialised in the US and Australia as we speak. So uh, I think two powerful stories in taking uh, research from a very basic inquiry about the function of genes uh, through to the end result. But I was struck with a, co a conversation I had with one of my colleagues in, in Lima Grain at the end of that. And he said to me, Matthew, you know, I recognize that for you scientists, publishing is very important, but that industry uptake is really golden. And I reflected on the excitement that I had the first day I was able to go into my local supermarket and pull a, a box of breakfast cereal off the shelf that I knew the main ingredient of that had come from our very own laboratory uh, through that pathway. And it was indeed uh, a deeply satisfying moment. So that's something that I really treasure uh, and I would like to see more of my colleagues experience uh, in your careers. So I want to give uh, one other the brief example of my time in Australia before I move a little to the international development scene. And it's perhaps um, less of a success story, but a lot of our work was on grain quality research and uh, I've titled this upsetting apple cut. So I'm going to give two examples here of areas where I think, think we did really uh, excellent research, but came up with findings that were perhaps contradictory to the dogma uh, and still resonate in my mind in an unresolved way uh, seven years later. So the first of those was to really look at the genetic uh, analysis of end use traits in wheat. So of the bread, and of the noodles that were made from, from wheat uh, products directly, rather than relying on, on measuring uh, predictive um, characteristics of wheat, such as processing characteristics or, or grain parameters. And this came up with uh, the conclusion that the degree of the genetic uh, control uh, of baking quality in this particular bread making process, sponge and dough baking that was exerted by the genes, uh, the protein genes that are um, long been focused on in terms of wheat quality was actually very small. And in many cases, there was actually no direct measurable genetic contribution to end quality. And so to me, this leaves an unresolved question. And I've been very interested to talk with Ben Hayes here in Quaffy about some of the work he did in uh, AgVic uh, to look at a whole of genome approach to determining the degree to which these characteristics are determined genetically. And of course, across the entire genome, there is significant genetic control. So we are, it seems to me, still missing a real understanding of the sum of the genes that contribute to these important traits. A second example was one that's always bothered me. Uh, and that was the whole story that we have in our wheat industry about late maturity alpha amylase. So the presence of alpha amylase in the grain under certain environmental conditions is taken as a negative uh, indicator for uh, wheat quality and of course, in pre-harvest sprouting, where alpha amylase is increased, it is indeed associated with lower quality, but many more genes are turned on in pre-harvest sprouted wheat than in late maturity alpha amylase wheat. To test this in CSRO, my colleagues and I, Jean-Philippe Raal uh, and 
Crispin, a number of other contributors to this work, overexpressed alpha amylase genes using transgenic technology in wheat. And there was a dramatic decrease in falling number or the uh, degree to which the viscosity of the wheat starch on, um, on uh, heating was with water was, uh, was changed. But paradoxically, it improved the baking qualities. And this is consistent with what a, a baker does when wheat is brought into the factory, which is to add alpha amylase. So I, I would really like us to take another view of this uh, phenomenon as a community, because I think it really is unresolved how critical it is for the downgrading of wheat quality. So here are two examples where our research, I think, has challenged long-held paradigms. Uh, and it reminds me that uncomfortable answers as scientists really should be taken as leading us to new opportunities. They're not the wrong answers. They're the answers that make us think. So to move on, uh, my second crossing of the Rubicon really was to move from what I might call here in Australia research and development to research for development. So research that makes a difference in people's lives. And as Ian uh, noted in the introduction, I moved to the International Rice Research Institute. Um, and I just note here that our mission was really around transforming lives through the global rice sector. And the way to do that was to link innovation the ability to catalyze dissemination and uptake of that innovation in order to transform people's lives. And IRI uh, was a, and is a, a remarkable platform to be able to do that. Um, the thousand or so staff operating across 16 countries, uh, Southeast Asia, South Asia uh, and West Africa and with very strong connections uh, in North Asia, in China, in South Korea and Japan. So I wanted to highlight perhaps three examples uh, of things that I'm particularly proud of in my time at IRI and uh, that should sustain that research for development into the future. The first of these was really to develop uh, the IRI South Asia Research Centre in Varanasi and I'm very proud to say it was opened by Prime Minister Modi. And it was all around uh, the initiative and the drive of the Indian government to double farmers' incomes, not just through enhancing productivity, but enhancing the value of the grain. So shown here uh, a whole lot of examples of uh, local land races of rice that have particular characteristics that consumers uh, really valued. So the task of taking uh, those characteristics through to mainstream rices. The second example was to work across the 10 ASEAN countries to develop a pre-competitive rice breeding and germplasm program. So there are many differences in the skill sets and the resources available to those breeding programs. And the ambition here was to bring them together with the three major uh, partners in the region, China, Japan, and South Korea, to lift the level of all of those breeding programs, but in a way which enabled them each to focus on their national interests. So, for example, some of the countries in the region have a particular focus on particular aspects of grain quality, and I'm sure we're all familiar with Thai rice or specialised Cambodian rices uh, and other countries in the region focused more on export markets uh, such as, as Vietnam. My third example uh, is really around golden rice and the ability um, after a long period of learning, I have to say, to be able in a public sector research organisation to bring together the skills required mm -hmm 
to deregulate golden rice with its high contents of, of beta carotene uh, to address the problems of uh, micronutrient deficiency. And we're able to take that with um, contributors from the Danforth Centre in the US through uh, USDA approval, Health Canada and Food Standards Australia as the gold standards of uh, regulatory approval networks across the world. And uh, we're now uh, ADERI engaged in that next stage of deployment of golden rice in the Philippines and Bangladesh. And I really want to acknowledge the wonderful work that Russell Renke and his team have done in relation to taking golden rice from the concept to uh, the reality that it is today. But finally, I just want to give one example. There are hundreds, if not thousands, but that I saw during my time at Erie. But just to illustrate the very direct impact that our work as scientists could have. So the chap that you're seeing in the field here is, is Mr. Altaf Hussain, and he has a farm in the Satkira district of, of southern Bangladesh. And the problem that he faced was that uh, because of the low-lying nature of, of Bangladesh and the um, exposure to cyclones, typhoon uh, damage, uh, in this case cyclone Ilya in 2009, the salinity on his farm greatly increased because they were inundated with seawater as a result of, of that event. And the local varieties, and for those with particularly sharp eyes, can read the label here, Kajolata, they could no longer be grown. They couldn't cope with that degree of uh, salinity. And particularly in the borrow season, which we're seeing here, there was no viable alternative crop. But I am very pleased to say that the work that Iri had done and Abdul Ishmael and his colleagues over many years to bring through um, salinity tolerant varieties, uh, we were able to provide them with novel varieties that can cope with the levels of salinity experienced uh, and en enable Mr. Hussain and his family to now operate a flourishing farm. And what he said to me when I visited this farm was that, you know, if this hadn't come along, he and his family would be working in the garment uh, workshops in Dakar in a life uh, that had uh, very few attractions to him and his family relative to controlling their own destiny on a farm where he can afford the education for his children, where he can afford the medical care uh, for his family. So we can, through our science, uh, make fundamental differences uh, in the lives of those uh, who are less fortunate for us. And I would like to just make uh, the observation that in the wake of the COVID uh, pandemic, I think the imperative is even more acute to be involved in uh, research for development. Yet I see, unfortunately, particularly the developed nations increasingly looking inwards. And I think as an international community, we must do more together to get back to a more generous international environment where we contribute uh, more fulsomely to uh, the development of research that makes a big difference in people's lives. So, my last point is that uh, in thinking about the opportunity to come back to Quaffy, one of the real attractions for me was that, well, here was an opportunity where I could do both research for development and research and development. And so there is a bridging of the two worlds here that I find particularly attractive. And our location um, adjacent to the tropical and tro subtropical zones uh, embedded in the subtropical zone of the world uh, 
uh, and in a region that really needs the science that we have to offer it is a very compelling opportunity. So that's one of the major drivers to, to come back here to Australia, to the University of Queensland with its uh, magnificent array of uh, talent uh, and capacity, to have the partnership with the Queensland government with through the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries as a wonderful way to have that interaction with industry and to see the work that we're doing translated into outcomes. Um, and you know, the opportunities afforded by the mutual facilities of UQ and DAP. All right, so what excites me clearly through my career has been uh, being in the quadrant of this graph where we see both research impact, high quality publications and industry and community impact. So you can expect that I'll be pushing for this for the future of coffee. So summing up these experience, um, research, making a difference, seeing impact, looking for the opportunities in what we don't understand uh, and supporting the development uh, and use of evidence-based science. So we can, in the end, have our cake and eat it too, in terms of being engaged in excellent research that has important uh, impact. So as a final point, Ian, I know we're about out of time. I just want to reflect on what the situation was in 1980 when I started my PhD, and perhaps this is targeted at some of our higher degree students who uh, were born this century. Right? So for those of you who don't know it, this is a telephone. Uh, we used to have one of these on our desk um, and that's how we communicated. This was how I wrote my PhD. Um, you know, there's one in the museum if you'd like to go and look at it, it's called a typewriter. And this is what we listened to our music on, a cassette tape and the damn thing used to jam every couple of plays uh, and causes endless grief. Here's the car that we drove and here this is the television that we watch. So things have changed mightily. Uh, and in my last slide, what did we watch on the TV? Well, some things don't change. Here's the very first State of Origin game uh, in 1980. And uh, of course, the Maroons won. So something uh, you might want to just take a moment to enjoy this year. But then what's the state of technology today? Look at the phones that we have, the amazing technology that we have right on our desktops uh, that was more powerful than a mainframe probably uh, in 1980. Right? The way which can carry our music with us everywhere, new cars, new TVs and uh, a new um, era in terms of embracing diversity um, and gender equality in sports. So many things have changed for the better. So to reflect on, on looking back on my career, the things I did in my PhD and postdoc um, would now be seen as, as the work of a few days or a week. Really, progress has been that much. We could do that Rubisco research much more thoroughly, much faster uh, than we could have in those days. The revolution in gene editing, what took a decade could be done in a few months. And uh, so we are limited more by our imagination than by the technology. And in weak quality research, I've got to say that while the technology has advanced, I'm sad to say that the conservatism in the way in which some of the standards are applied in industry actually stifles innovation. And I think this is a conversation that we need to come back to. And then in the rice research for development, I think the kinds of work that Coffee does in GYBIM, for example, uh, should be much more promulgated and used in the public sector. So I ask you to reflect on what this will look like for you in the future. So 
Final point, uh, there's never been a more important time to be an agri-food scientist. You have the tools and the science to do amazing things. So please, do amazing things. So I just, as a last point of my career, reflect that that linear line turned into seven different employers, each with their own different characteristics uh, and their different ways of thinking and operating. So a very rich experience. And I'd like to thank you for uh, indulging me through this presentation, but I want to acknowledge great people. I've mentioned a few, but there were so many contributors to the research that's presented here. I don't want to dwell on a small number enough and um, upset uh, those who weren't mentioned. So thank you to all of you. You know who you were. Great organisations, great opportunities and a great future for coffee. So to come back to the theme of international development uh, and to one of the greats of the 20th century, in our own gentle way, we can all shape the world. So thank you, Ian. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thanks very much, Matthew. Um, we've got a little bit of time left for questions. And uh, first, I just want to make a comment. I was really glad on that slide where you're updating us from the 1980s to now that you left the state of origin and moved to the tennis. That was that, that was that was extremely diplomatic. Got my blue jumper on. <laughs> oh no. Okay. Well, we, we've got uh, we've got some um, questions. Uh, We've got one from Owen Powell, which says, what's the current capability to link more poly polygenic nutritional traits to breeding outcomes and varietal development? Yeah, um, look, uh, I think um, the, uh, the advances in genomic selection have been extraordinary. I think, you know, really that's an area where I'm, I'm not, I've never been um, at the forefront of that, but, I'm sure Ben would love to take on the challenge of, of for example, looking at how we can uh, embrace uh, genomic selection, not just for yield and for abiotic stress examples, but in uh, being able to have breeding values for particular end use or nutritional traits. Um, there aren't, a, unless I'm mistaken, there aren't a lot of examples of that yet but maybe this is an area for uh, the future. But we have uh, those um, tools, plus the ability to uh, make uh, you know, multiple uh, additive genome edits in a way that was never possible. That omega-3 example that I, I showed was a labor of love again to knit together seven or eight genes to recreate a pathway. Uh, I think that could be done um, in a much less laborious way with the tools that we have now. But it's knowing what we want to do. That's the critical thing now. This is what I want to emphasize. It's we're limited more by uh, our imagination and our understanding of what is, is needed to be done than perhaps by the tools. So this is our challenge. Okay, if I may, I, I'm gonna ask you a question, Matthew. Um, so the, the work you did on wheat and barley, it was all aimed at um, human nutritional outcomes, but with some of the changes that you made, were there other sort of non-food applications to some of, the, some of the products that you produced? Yeah, certainly part of the value proposition for the homeless wheat um, was, for example, um, to produce uh, starches that would be useful in um, formulating materials, plastic replacement. I mean, homeless maize starch has been used in that way uh, for a number of years. And I think there's more innovation that could be done uh, around that target. But the um, path to market, and I guess the economic driver is less compelling. Um, so perhaps that's a secondary benefit of that project that will, will flow through. Um, 
in the Bali Max example, um, no, it was more about producing rather than an ingredient, a whole grain that had a package of nutritional benefits. And I think that plays more to perhaps one of the trends that's um, taken hold more strongly over the last uh, five to seven years in nutrition, which is really to think about how can we position a number of these nutritionally enhanced products in a diet rather than relying on a single food to deliver a nutritional benefit. So perhaps that's our challenge as agricultural scientists um, into the future. Okay, and um, another one is um, with, uh, I mean, you were at, uh, at Erie and, uh, and we know that Erie was developing some high amylose rice. What's the current status of high amylose rice? Well, it certainly um, exists. And uh, again, the mutation has been known for many years. Um, the, um, the limitation was, is twofold. One is that there is a yield penalty associated. And when you're in a research for development context um, yield, and of course, consumer acceptance, but the two have to go together. You, you can't cope with very much of a yield penalty before a farmer will say, well, I'm not going there. And the second is that, you know, high amylose starches in a food that's consumed as a whole food have a very different cooking uh, profile and indeed, you know, extremely firm texture, if not cement-like texture. Uh, and so that's a real impediment to adoption. But there are opportunities uh, in terms of, of milled flowers, for example, that will be undoubtedly taken up. But they're the major impediments uh, that were run into with high amylose rice. Okay. Um, and now there's a question back on the, more towards the beginning of your talk. Um, Clearly your Abisco work was far ahead of its time. In 2021, do you think photosynthesis research will finally make an impact in the translational space um, or will it remain aspirational? Yeah, look, I mean, we see some of the, the work coming through now, the, the right project and so on uh, with some um, innovations that look very promising in terms of uh, manipulating photosynthesis um, and uh, I think in undoubtedly in uh, you know, some of the work in terms of uh, whole genome predictions, we're, we're accumulating genes of minor effect, which are photosynthetic um, genes in order to produce some of those improvements in, in photosynthesis. I guess the, um, the question that's always been uh, confronted is that where we make fairly radical changes in photosynthesis, there's usually some form of, of trade-off or compensating uh, effect. So that when we look at the yield equation of looking at grain size and looking at tiller number, um, et cetera, grain number, we often see things that look very promising in the glasshouse fall over in the field or, or lose their impact in the field because under a, a canopy uh, production, system the plant compensates uh, and so i think that's the challenge but look photosynthesis is fundamental uh, and so to harness uh, that energy in terms of not just biomass but the outcome of uh, the the grain or the the valuable component of the plant whatever plant that is um, must still be on our radar Okay, thanks, Matthew. And um, seeing what the time is, and I thank people for, for staying online, and unfortunately, we can't ask all the questions that have been um, put up from people on the Q&A. Um, so um, we're going to have to finish the seminar now because um, we, we do have this time slot and, and um, other people do need to get on with things as well. Um, so thank you very much, Matthew, and I'm going to just finish by um, announcing that next week we also have a, a, a seminar.
and it's uh, Max Muller, who is part of CNAPS, who will be um, talking about, um, well, now that we've lost that slide. Um, anyway, he, he's, he's going to be giving the seminar next week. Um, and you can view our science seminars webpage. So thank you very much, everyone.